Amen. It's good to see everybody here today. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms and the and the substitute moms and the moms that the kids flock to and the moms that may have empty arms today and those of you who may not have your mom with you today. Um, we understand that today is not always a, a very happy day for everybody, but we want you to have joy today. We really do. Um, whether your children are here with you or not, the love of God and the love of this church is here with you today. Amen. So why don't we give all of our moms a big round of applause. Yes. Thank God for all of you. Amen. 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 So we're going to start this today. I, I want you to know that you are welcome and you are loved in this place. So we're going to do something a little different than what we normally do. As we're singing this, I want you to walk around and greet our guests. I want you to walk around and greet each other and, and just with a joy and a smile. Amen. Everybody smile. Show those teeth. Show those pearly whites, right? So as we start to sing, why don't you walk around and greet each other in the name of the Lord. We're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of the ark. Amen. Pray that you make yourself at home. continue to pray for all of our members that are traveling today, those that are going to be with their moms, going to be with family and friends. 
Um, there's quite a few, so please keep them in your prayers. But I'm glad that you are here today. And you know that God is here. I don't know if you felt it when you came in the door the way that I did, but he is truly here. And he wants you to give him all your troubles. He wants to give you, he wants you to give him all of your pain, all of your questions, and all of your worries. You can dump it at his feet today. You can do that today. And you can leave lighter than you came. You can leave with a joy in your heart and a pep in your step because God is with you. So I wonder if you just worship with us today. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, yes, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Come on, sing with us. You give life. You give
on. He gives you the breath in your body today. Are you thankful? Are you thankful today? All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh, sing that again. Sing it from your heart. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. the time you leave here you will feel comfortable lifting your hands to the God of glory and surrendering to him your heart and your soul and your mind oh because he only wants your good today Jesus I love you Lord I'm thankful for the breath that you've given me thank you God thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus there are people today who cannot do what we are doing they're on oxygen they're struggling to breathe. There's no way they could sing a verse of a song because they cannot, they don't have the breath to do it. Aren't you glad that you have the breath today to give him thanks, to give him praise, and to give him glory? I feel his presence in this place, and I'm thankful to know him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. No word but holy, that's what I would say, if I were asked today to convey who you are, no 
gracious God that loves us so much. Can we thank him today for his precious goodness and his presence in this place? Lord bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> Amen. As the ushers come and get ready to receive our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. I wonder today if you would give an offering in honor of your mom. Maybe an, an offering in honor of the, the woman who you called mom. Maybe she raised you as your mom. And do that as, as an offering to God. But, you know, I can't think of a, I can tell you right now that there is nothing more precious to me than seeing my kids serve God. And when they give to God, when they give special offerings to God, I know what that money's going for. It's going to either send a kid to camp or it's going to uh, an, a special outreach project that we have. Y'all know that the ARC has always, up, up to really tough COVID times, been known for its giving. We've given food boxes to the elderly. We have fixed cars for single moms. Lord have mercy, I don't, handicap ramps for people who needed a handicap ramp. I can't even think of all the things. Giving out backpacks to kids and school supplies to teachers. That's just, the, that's who we are here. So when I say give an offering in honor of your mom, that's gonna bless somebody else. It's gonna reach a soul. It's gonna, it's gonna do what we do best. And when we look at people who are down and out and say, I see goodness in you. You don't always have to stay addicted. It's changed lives. We've got people in this room today whose lives have been changed because somebody gave, and I thank you for that. You know, this doesn't happen all on its own. The lights don't pay for themselves, and, and contrary to popular belief, um, we don't get breaks on electricity. They charge us more than what they charge normal people. So, it you know, we still have to have ways to operate, and all of our staff all of our staff work jobs outside the church. All of us. <laughs> so this is not padding some preacher's pocket. Nope, not here. That, that may be another place, and that's okay, because preachers have to eat too. But we work to do what we do because we love this city, and we love the people of this city. <clears throat> so when you give, keep that in mind. I challenge you, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And I can't wait, Brother Warren, one day when we get to heaven and somebody runs up to you. Y'all don't know this, but this man just gave $100 today so I could buy a Bible for somebody that wants one. He said, here, just give it. And Warren, one of these days in heaven, somebody's going to run up to you that you have never seen you don't have a clue who they are. And they're going to say thank you because when you gave that money, my grandmama taught me a Bible study. And she gave me that Bible. I still had it until the day we came to heaven. And you changed my life. You don't realize it, but you changed my life with what you gave. There are going to be so many people run up to so many of you and say, you never saw me but you changed my life. You don't know me, but this is what, I'm here because of you. I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you are faithful. I'm here because you thought outside of yourself and you thought outside of just, oh, it's me, myself, and I. You, talk, you went way above and beyond and you gave. So I'm here today and I can't wait to meet them. I cannot wait to meet them. So, Brother Warren, would you please pray and ask God's blessings over this offering and these precious, precious people today. I'm going to give you the mic. can stand if you would like. We're going to sing this last song before the preacher comes.
Yes, I can't wait to hear this preacher. Amen. you free, why don't you give him a good praise right now? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you. You can be seated. It is so great to have all of our guests today. I won't call them all by name. Um, I've been told that that embarrasses people sometimes, so I don't want to call you out, but I'm giving you a big old hug from Mama G and so thankful that you came today, and I love your precious heart. I really do. And even though you don't act precious sometimes. Anybody been like that? Your kids don't act precious sometimes. You just say, you know what, I just want to go sell them on eBay. And then somebody says, no, you made them yourselves. And Well, I'll sell them on Etsy. Yeah. yeah. Or Sheen. Yeah. But we're so glad that all of you are here with all your littles and all your bigs. And I, I just want you to know today I am so proud of this mother of our church and I am so proud of the woman of God that she has become that she's always been she's always been different even when she was a teenager she was different I believe even then the Lord had a call on her life and she knew it and Bishop knew it he knew it from the beginning he told her you're gonna be my daughter one day she was 13 12 12, 12 excuse me she was 12 Kind of never met, met kind of weirded her out a little bit. I, if I was 12 and some older gentleman looked at me and said that, I would be like, mm. Yeah, stranger danger. No, but he was so loving, she knew she knew that she could trust him. And she is a part of our family, and we love her so much. And I know that she and Seth are going to take this church into heights that we never dreamed and I am behind them a thousand percent saying go girl go run girl run I believe in you and I love you so much Hannah can't wait to hear what she has to say everybody give her a big woohoo of the Lord this morning. I'm so glad that you're all here today. I want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers that are here, um, and a happy Mother's Day online to all of our ARC family that is not here with us today, that is out traveling, visiting with their mothers. We miss you, and we wish you were here, but we know that you're with your mama, and that's where you need to be today. Um, we're going to have a good time today. I like to have fun, 
the Lord likes for us to have fun. So kind of relax a little bit. Um, church doesn't have to be rigid, if that's what you've been told. So we're going to laugh a little bit. We might cry a little bit. I'm talking to the ladies. We're going to laugh a little bit. We're going to cry a little bit. We'll probably laugh until we cry a little bit. But it's going to be a great time. And the men will probably sit there and not cry. They might laugh, but they might not cry. So welcome today. I want you all to know I'm humbled to stand before you. I don't, I don't consider myself anybody special, um, but I am obedient um, to the Lord and um, I think what he has to say today is going to help us, um, us women, um, whether you're a mother or you're not a mother yet, or um, your children are grown and you don't think that you have a place on this Mother's Day, like how could, how could a Mother's Day message apply to me? My children are grown and they have families of their own and... My time has passed, um, so this is for all women, whether you, you might not even be in a relationship, you may not be married, you, so I want to speak to all women today, and um, men, y'all hang in there, Father's Day's coming. <laughs> we'll give y'all a little break today, because um, I know a lot of times at church, a lot of responsibility does fall on the men and families, um, and I think you should also listen today too, because it may it may help you. Um, it may help you help the women in your life. Um, so I hope everyone leaves today encouraged, um, and that this helps you. Um, we're gonna look at Proverbs 31 and 26, and don't worry, I'm not going there. Um, I'm not gonna Proverbs 31 woman you to death today, so don't worry. Um, we're just going to read this one scripture, and it says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. And then I want to look at 1 Corinthians 14 and 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. None of them are without significance. Every voice in this world has a purpose. And I want to talk to you today about the power of a woman's voice. Um, we've already prayed several times in this service, so we're just going to jump right into it. All throughout Scripture, we see God uses women's voices to speak. Um, and there are many times in the scripture that women's voices are used in it was not God who gave them that voice to speak. Um, and despite women's voices often being silenced or dismissed as irrelevant in the eyes of religion or the world or people individually, um, Maybe you're a woman and you're in the business world or wherever it may be, and people may think that you don't have as much to offer. They just kind of cast your opinion to the side because you're a woman or you're so-and-so or you're without significance. But that's, not what, that's not what Scripture says, and that's not how God looks at you either. Um, God gave women a specific voice and called them to speak to specific circumstances at specific times. Now, women are not men, and they do not have the same voice as men. God has called men to speak, and he has given them a voice as well. But he's also given women a place and a voice in his kingdom. Every voice in the kingdom of God matters. Your voice as a woman matters. I don't care if you are six years old, and I don't care if you're 95 years old. What you have to say is significant. 
and what you pour into yourself is what is going to come out of your mouth. Um, I'm going to call her out. Um, uh, Miss Annabelle, my sweet niece, um, her, f her first week in K4, um, y'all know her, she has a bubbly personality. Um, her teacher told um, Kelsey, she said, I just love her personality. She is so sweet. She wants to be friends with everybody. She just goes up to people like, we're going to be friends. I don't know if you know that, but we're going to be friends. Um, I'm going to be your friend. You don't have to be my friend, but I'm going to be your friend. Um, and her teacher said, but maybe tell her that she probably shouldn't tell her friends on the playground that liars go to hell. Um, and she's like, but mom, yeah. where's the lie <laughs> is all I'm saying. Um, tell them, th that's, what, that's what my Sunday school teacher told me. And I read it in the Bible. And I heard them say something, and then they said they did not say it. And liars go to hell. <laughs> so, so every voice, what... Why does she know that? Because scripture was poured into her. And even at four years old, she she heard somebody and she was, I'm going to go preach the gospel to these people <laughs> right here. So every voice, the from the youngest to the oldest, even women, is important to God. And it's important to the kingdom of God. As women, as mothers, as wives, what we say carries weight. You know, Scripture talks about how we'll be judged for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. And that's all of us. But I'm speaking specifically about us women today. What you say to your children, what you don't say to your children, what you say to your husband, what you don't say to your husband, what you say to the lady at the grocery store, all of it matters, and I'm not going to preach to you about being um, how you should treat your kids today because my son is perfect. <laughs> I just don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't help you. I'm sure ca catch me next Mother's Day, and I might feel different when he's, you know, running around being a little terrorist. But um, today he's perfect, and I can't relate to you. <laughs> he's back there sleeping, so. When Jesus came to earth, the religious people were astonished. If you read the Gospels, and I, I hate to make a chosen reference this early into the day, but they were astonished that Jesus acknowledged women and that he, he, he sat down and he cared what they had to say. He sat down with the woman at the well that nobody, not even other women, would sit down and talk to, and he didn't... He didn't come to her and say, I know all your problems. You need to get... He sat down. He wanted to hear what she had to say. What do you, he, he wanted to pick her brain a little bit because what she had to say was important to him. And what she had to say prompted his response, and that changed her life. What came across her lips changed her life, and I'm sure it changed her family's life too. So I want to show you a couple of different ways in Scripture that a woman's voice was used and how it impacted her and everyone around her. So let's take it all the way back to the beginning, to the garden, in Genesis. And we all know the story. God gave Adam and Eve specific instructions to not, you just can't eat the fruit off of this one specific tree. You can have everything else. And along comes the serpent who tells Eve, you won't die if you eat this fruit. You'll be like God. He's just He just wants to keep you down. He just wants to keep you oppressed. He doesn't... And... And then what happened? Pull up 
Genesis 3 and verse, we're going to go verse 6 through verse 12. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they were they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And this has plagued us since. This has been our cross to bear, ladies. This is how we get blamed for everything. So, but that's not where I'm going. Now, God punished Adam and Eve individually. If you, if you keep reading, we're not going to go there today, but you can read the whole chapter 3 of Genesis. He, he cursed Eve. He cursed Adam, woman, man, individually because their choice to eat of the fruit was individual. Nobody twisted anyone's arm. Everyone chose for themselves to eat of the tree. So, Adam's not off the hook. He still made that choice himself. His wife did not shove it down his throat. He chose to do that. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Eve chose to use her voice, and it impacted her husband. She spoke, and he listened. And once they ate, the scripture says it saw their nakedness, once they both ate of the tree, they both, this realization came to them. When they, when she used her voice and they chose to eat of that tree, it changed the way they saw each other. It changed their relationship. And most importantly, it changed their relationship with God. It changed the environment that they lived in. They couldn't live in the beautiful garden anymore. The garden was perfect, but there was sin now, and they couldn't stay there. They had to go somewhere else. So it changed how they looked at each other. It changed their relationship. It changed the future of their children. Go read about their children. Um, that probably would not have been the case had that pivotal moment not happened it changed their relationship it changed the environment that they lived in and it changed their relationship with God so I want to ask you women but I, men too anybody where are the voices in your life coming from where are they coming from I don't want to know not just what they're saying but where are they coming from who are the people that you allow to speak into your life? How do they live their life? If they don't, if you don't want to live your life the way that they're living, they should not have a voice in your life. Because whoever speaks, whatever is spoken into you is eventually going to come out. We know it in the scripture. We, you probably quote it all the time. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. There's no, everything that you put in front of your eyes, in your ears, it's going to come out. It's going to come out, and it's not going to come out when you think it's going to come out. You might, you might surround yourself with voices day in and day out and think that you have a hold on it because you're still showing up to church and you're still volunteering in the church, and then... It'll come out, and 
you know, it's not just going to come out when you're by yourself. It's going to come out on the people that you love. And it's going to, like I said, Eve's choice to use her voice, it changed her family. It changed the world as, as they knew it in that moment. We don't know how long that they lived in that garden before they made that choice. We go from one chapter to the next, but we don't know how much time, how long they lived in that garden and enjoyed that life before that choice was made and it was taken from them. I'm sure it probably didn't happen. We all think that on on day seven or day six, the Lord told them this, and on day eight, the following Monday, the serpent showed up. He probably didn't because what God had told them was probably still fresh. But he probably waited until what God had told them, it wasn't at the forefront of their mind anymore. It wasn't what had just been spoken to them. The time had passed. And so it wasn't as easy to remember, like, well, it's been so long, maybe I, maybe I just forgot what God said. Maybe you're right, serpent. Maybe, maybe it did come off a little different and I'm just I'm just not remembering correctly so the privilege of a powerful voice always comes with consequences attached to it we can't throw our words around and think that they don't make an impact and they also it also comes with a big responsibility what we have a huge responsibility to use our voice, especially as followers of Christ, to use our voice. Um, um, I got into a little Facebook debate this past week um, with somebody, and, you know, I have respect for this person. Um, they're a, someone we've known for a long time, consider um, their fellow ministers of the gospel, um, have nothing but respect for them. Um, and, you know, we disagreed on something, and that's okay. It's okay to disagree with people. Um, I'm not going to go and block this person and, um, you know, because there was a disagreement. I, I don't, I'm not opposed to disagreement, um, because I know what I believe, I know what the Bible says, and I don't have to, um, it doesn't intimidate me if somebody disagrees with me. Um, but, you know, we went back and forth, and, you know, at the end of the conversation, I don't, I don't think he necessarily was disagreeing with what I was saying because we were talking about this post that was made by somebody, and the person who made the original post, I don't know them. Um, they're some minister that apparently people know of well. Um, and... You know, they were talking about everything he said was the truth, and if people don't understand that, then I don't know. And, I, you know, I was like, maybe what he's saying isn't wrong. I understand the point that he's trying to make, but my point was everything that comes out of our mouths as Christians, especially when you get on the Internet, um, everything that you say, you do know that people read that. Believers and non-believers. So as believers, we should not get on the internet and rally together all of our believer friends and like, oh yeah, this is wrong and I can't believe they were doing that. And all because all of your unbeliever friends are reading that. You know what they're thinking? I don't know what religion they got, but I don't want it. Because they're being the nastiest people I've ever heard in their comments and just railing on people and they supposed to ser they're supposed to be serving a God who loves and they're being hateful you can you can you can say something that's true and say it in the wrong way I told I, I joke with my husband about it all the time because one thing that the Lord is um, teaching me and I I chant it to myself sometimes um, is something may be true, but is it necessary? Something you s it might be true. You don't know how many comments on stuff I type and delete. And then type it 
and delete it. Because you know, what I said was true. I even put a little scripture in there. I even quoted a little verse. But was it necessary? Did what I have did what I have to say? Yes, was it spoken in love? Was it going to impact the person that I'm saying it to? And more importantly, the people that are going to scroll by and see it, are they going to are they going to be compelled to come to God? Does what I have to say bring glory back to him or does it make people want to get further and further away from him? There's a time to sp- there there is a the truth of God's word and there are things in God's word that are harsh and they're just cut and dry and to the point and it's this is sin and that's just all there is to it. Yes. But the time to teach somebody about that isn't on Facebook. People, if you don't have a relationship with people, they don't care what you have to say. I could go to somebody in Walmart and tell them, you know, they could have their buggy full of beer, and I could say, you know, getting drunk is a sin. (laughs) And you know what? They don't care. They don't care. First of all, they're like, who are you? Who died and left you on the throne? That's people people want to know that you care about them before they're going to care what you have to say. We were talking about this the other day and I didn't even know I was going to talk about this when we talked about it. Um, You know, I only allow about five people to speak into my life. Now, I have lots of friends. I have lots of loved ones. But there's only about five and they don't even know that they are these people because I don't want anybody to ever think that they can take advantage of the fact that they can speak into my life. So they don't even know that they're one of these. But there's only about five people that if they came to me and they jerked my coattail and said, hey, you're wrong and you need to straighten up, and I would say, okay, yeah. Because I have a relationship with them, I know that they love me, I know that they want what's best for me, and I know that they're not going to publicly humiliate me to try to straighten me up. And, the and you know, if you have... 15, 11 million people that can talk to you and you and they say, oh, I think you should do this. And you say, okay, well, I'm going to do this. And then somebody else says, well, I think you should do this. And you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. You're just, you're swayed. You have to have people that you trust that can speak to you and and jerk your, your coat tail and say, hey, hey, girl, you might need to straighten up a little bit. You know, when, when you said this, it kind of, you know, you kind of came off harsh, and maybe you need to, you know, kind of, and I, and I can't tell you who those people should be in your life, but I can tell you this, they should be someone you trust, they should be somebody that loves you, and only wants what's best for you, somebody that's filled with the Spirit, um, because I have lots of friends at work. But they ain't, they don't speak into my life. We have conversation at work. We might go to lunch. We might spend time together. They don't speak into into my life. they when they tell me something, I'm not I'm not taking that check to the bank and cashing it. There's only a handful of people that are close to me that I I see their walk with God and I know I know that when they say something to me that that it's from here and it's not from ego it's not to tear me down and you know who those people are in your life and that wasn't in my notes that was free you um so we're going to look at Abigail and the scripture and she doesn't get talked about very much and I'm really not sure why because she you know wonderful wonderful woman. Um, you can read the entire account in 1 Samuel 25, um, just that whole chapter. Um, but I'm just going to kind of, we're going to hit the hot spots. Um, so um, Abigail's husband, Nabal, what a man. Um, 
His his name literally meant blockhead. He was a jerk. He was foolish. You know, he's terrible, terrible, terrible. And we find David, and David has young men that he um, he sends to Nabal, and he gives them all this stuff that, to say to Nabal, like blessings to you and prosperity and, you know, just kind of, you know, blowing each other's head up, you know. Um, and, you know, tell him that some of his young men um, – have been with us, you know, they ran into them, and we took good care of them while they were with us, none of their stuff was stolen while they were with us, you know, we made sure that they had food, they had drink, and, you know, kind of, you know, and the proper thing for Nabal to do would have been to feed these young men of David's, and everybody knew who David was, this was after the whole Goliath thing, Everybody knew who David was. He was already, he was anointed to be king. Everybody knew who David was. And so the men go to Nabal. They greet him. They tell him all the paragraph that David told him to say. And he says, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? What a jerk. What a jerk. He was just nasty. And, you know, just why would I take food from from my servants and give to you? And then he sent them back to David. And they went back to David. And David was like, get your swords. We're going to get this guy. And so they set out to go get him. It's funny if you read the very end of the, um, the chapter before, um, Saul was, like, giving accolades to David about how merciful he was to him. Um, and then, like, 20 verses later, David's like, because Saul's like, you returned kindness to me when I did evil to you. And then 20 verses later, David's like, let's cut this guy's head off. Yeah. Like, he was done. He humiliated David. And so one of Nabal's little servants over in the back overheard it. You know what he this, this guy is the real hero of this story because he said, we got to go tell Abigail. So they, they went to Abigail, and they told her the whole, they gave her the skinny. And you know what the servant said? Consider what you're going to do about this. Like, these two guys have just butted heads. They're in a spat. They're about to take each other's heads off. Abigail, we need you to go in there, and we don't know what you're going to do, but we need you to fix it. Have you ever had a, a situation you're like, mm. uh, look, if stuff goes down in the Gleason Lighthill family, somebody go get Mama G. <laughs> somebody go get Mama G because I'm about to let my good be evil spoken of. I'm about to. We're, we have a very similar personalities, um, but she likes to pray for people. I like to punch people. Um, that's the, that's the small difference in our personality, and I'm teach, I'm, I'm teaching her how to punch a little bit, and she's teaching me how to pray, um, because they really balance each other out. So, when Seth comes to me and wants wisdom, sometimes I can give it, but sometimes I'm like, we gotta call mom, we gotta call mom, get her on the phone, you know, we'll just come across the street, we'll come across the street, we need to sit down, we need to have a meeting, um, we know what you're gonna do. And so Abigail goes in there, she starts she starts baking all this stuff, making all this food, and, you know, just, and then she loads it up on her donkey, and she, she goes, and she, and she sees David, and she jumps off her donkey, and she goes running, and you know what she does? She falls down at David's feet and says, she, d she barely even acknowledges her husband. She's like, look, he's an idiot. He's, his name means foolish. That's literally what she told David. His name means that he's foolish. She was like, hold this against me. This, that, my husband, hold it against me. This is, you know, lay all the blame on me. And then she goes into repenting and asking for David to spare her and forgive her. 
can tell right now, I'm not Abigail. I, I pray to have it in me one day, but the Lord is working on me, and I don't know that I could. At, um, I'm being transparent, and if, if all y'all say that y'all could, liars. So Abigail laid aside all the pride that she had in herself because she knew her house was in trouble, and she had to do something. Have have you ever, I don't know if anybody in this room, you're the fixer of your family. Um, Now, on the Gleason Lighthill side, um, Mama G is the fixer. Um, But believe it or not, on my side of the family, I'm one of the fixers. There's several of us. Um, Believe it or not. (laughs) Me and Kelsey over here, it's as good as it's getting sometimes. Um, So... You know, when stuff goes wrong, there's that one there's that one person that you gotta go be like, Hey, we gotta fix this. We need you to have intervention. We need you to talk to somebody. If you're that person, you know. You don't know how many times my daddy has put himself in the hospital for drinking Red Bulls. <laughs> and me and my sister have to go to his bedside and have an intervention with him. And it's like, yeah, my, he's good for about two days. My little sister will call us and be like, I need you to talk to Daddy. I need you to talk to Daddy. <laughs> he just drank four Red Bulls before he left the house this morning. And you you got you to gotta run in there and you got to run interference. Those of you with young children, again, not me. He's not mobile yet, so he can't do too much wrong. Um, but when your kids get into it, you know, you got two or three or more kids, and they're just going at it, and you gotta, you gotta run interference. Like, should I let them kill themselves today, or do I interfere? Um. So, that's what she had to do. She had to run interference, and she laid aside all her pride, and instead of using her voice to go to David and say, "Just spare me." but do what you got to do to my husband. Or she could have just sat back and said, "That was my, my husband did that. You know, you know, she, instead of laying blame, she was like, I got to do something. She could have said, that's my husband's fault. He got himself into that mess. He's just going to have to deal with the consequences. But you know what would have happened? Their whole house would have died. If you go read chapter 25, David was coming for everybody in Nabal's house. He wasn't just coming for Nabal. He was coming for the kids, her, the servants, the dog, everybody. Nobody was safe. He was coming for everybody. And so she had, you know what? She had to, she had to eat crow. She was like, I got I to gotta lay aside myself and make this right because it's what's best for my family. So what you say can build your family up or it can cast them down. We live in an, in a society of it's not my fault. Somebody did that to me and that's not my fault. It's not my fault that I acted that way because so and so caused me to act that way. In a society of it's not my fault, be an Abigail. And there's there is a time to stand up for yourself. There is a time to speak up. But in this situation, Abigail could have spoken up for herself and left her. And you know what? Her kids still would have died. Her, fa- you know, the people in their, ha- you know, that she cared for, that she did life with, they would have all died too. You know, it wasn't just her husband's life at stake. Um, and if you read the entire chapter, you will eventually see that um, David shows her mercy. And Nabal dies, not by David's hand. And then David marries Abigail. So, you know, she did the right thing. She, you know, it seems like this is not the first time she's probably had to bail him out. Um, So there's many of other accounts that I could have given you today of women who used their voices, um, we don't have enough time to go through them, but I want to, 
and I'm getting ready to close in just a, a minute. I want to compare the two women that we talked about today. And there's a difference between how Eve used her voice and how Abigail used her voice. There's a big difference. And Eve was thinking about one person when she used her voice. Abigail was thinking of others. Others. And I know if you go to church here, or I'll wear you out with it. I don't care. But that's our motto here. We love God first with all of our hearts, and we love people. Because those are the two greatest commandments. And our, our life is about others. And Abigail demonstrated that. Everything that we do, everything that, it all comes back around to that. So if you're tired of hearing it, I'm sorry, but that's what it is. We can use our voice for others, or we can use our voice for ourselves. You know, when you're always thinking of you and what your life is about and what your struggles are and your things and your feelings and me and me and me and, and, well, I don't feel like this and I was wronged and I, 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 I. Eve, all she thought about is how she, she wanted. She wanted this. This is what I want. This is what seems good to me. Abigail, David could have killed Abigail right there in that road. He could have he could have disregarded every he didn't have to show mercy to her. He could have taken her head off and kept going down the road. She put herself and when the servant came to her, she could have loaded up the kids and was like, Well, we got thank you for warning me, let's get out of here. But no, she turned around and she went to she went, you know why? Because others. Because it wasn't about her in that moment. She laid aside all of the her in her. And she said, I gotta make this right. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make, I didn't, I didn't make this wrong, but I gotta make it right. You know? Do you, Use your voice to make wrongs right. Even if you're not the one who made it wrong. There's there's times I know I'm right. I know. I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm just saying I'm not wrong. But you know what? There's times that that I have to humble myself because I can be very... just straightforward and you know you know I, I'm very opinionated um, you know and I don't think there's anything wrong with that but you know God has to rein me in and say you were right but what that's why he's the, you know it was true but it w- wasn't necessary that's why he's teaching me that um, and he'll be like you could say that what good is going to come from it? Is it going to turn people to me? Is it going to, is it, or is your good going to be evil spoken of because of the choice to use the words that you did? And I'm not saying don't stand up for yourself or let people walk all over you. That's why we have to walk in the spirit because there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. Sometimes your silence says everything that needs to be said. Sometimes there's some situations that don't, it doesn't deserve your voice. It doesn't deserve your time. Your, it doesn't deserve a response from you. You have so many other things that you could be doing with your time. It, it just, it doesn't concern you. Um, we have friends of ours and um, we were talking and there was a situation that they were going through and before it ever came up they didn't even know it was coming up he he told Seth and I he was like you know I was praying before and God told me don't say anything he didn't even know what it was but 
He didn't even know what he was walking into. He had no clue. But God had been speaking to him all week and said, don't say, don't open your mouth. And that's why the vo- one of the voices that should always be speaking to you is God's voice. Because God's going to tell you, you keep your mouth closed. You don't say, you're going to, you're going to open up a bigger can of worms than you're going to be able to deal with if you open up your mouth. Don't defend yourself. Don't defend yourself to those people. You keep your mouth shut. You keep your head down and you let me do what I do. So there's a time to speak and there's a time to be quiet, but there is a time to use your voice. You use your voice every day when you speak to your kids in the morning, when you speak to your husband, when you speak to your coworkers. You know, and what are you known for to those people? How did how do they perceive you? How you speak to them is how they perceive you, and that's important because we're gonna have to answer for everything. I, I've said some things that I wish that I could take back in the past, or I was sharp to somebody, and I felt like. You know, there. You know, there's people when we were in when we were in youth group that they don't go to church here anymore. And you know, I, I thought I was friends with them, but for some reason they don't they don't really talk to me. And I can't remember everything I said when I was 13 years old. But but sometimes it plagues me, God, because teenagers are jerks sometimes. And I was like. You know, and it and it plagues me like God was it was that some way to them? Was I that person in youth group that didn't make them feel like they were apart? You know, and God has had to help me with that because He's like, you know, you can't you can't live and and you know, condemn yourself for something you said when you were thirteen, fourteen years old that you don't even know that you said. But that's why it's so important to be so careful. Every word that we say, when in doubt, shut up. That if I can leave you with nothing else today, when in doubt, just keep your mouth closed. Close your mouth until you've healed your heart. Because there's there's some there's some situations that when we were In our identity series, I talked about it. You might think you're over something and then something comes across your lips and you're like, where did that come from? I don't know. It just came out. I thought I was over that. But there it came out my mouth. So if, if something has broken you or hurt you or a situation... Or somebody has hurt you, keep your mouth shut until God heals your heart. Because you'll never be able to address it with a broken heart. So why don't we all stand? And because I don't want to put anybody on the spot, I wonder if you're a mother here today, why don't we all just come down to the front? Nobody's going to put their hands all over you and get all up in your face. 